there was a couple other things in the measurements that I thought, well, okay, those are problems, technically speaking, but I didn't really notice them in my listening. Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm gonna to be reviewing a $3,000 Dyn Audio speaker. This is my first Dyn Audio speaker review but it's not my first introduction to Dyn Audio. I have been a Dyn Audio fan for well over a decade. In fact, my first Dyn Audio speakers were the, I believe it is the MD-102 tweeters for car audio. And then it was the MW-162 midwoofers. And then at some point I went stupid and paid a lot of money for their SOTAR 2 430 three to four inch, depending on how you measure them, mid ranges for my previous car audio system. Why? Because Don Audio generally just has a smooth, buttery sound, right? That's what most people say. And in this particular case of the Dyn Audio Special 40 speaker, which you see over my shoulder, it's no different. But the interesting thing about this speaker is that I listened to this for quite a bit, a couple different times. When I saw the measurements, I thought, huh, they weren't bad. I want to make sure that that's understood, but they weren't great. There were a couple things that I was able to easily identify in the measurements. I heard them. I was like, you know, that's a problem, kind of stands out. I'm going to look for that in the measurements, saw it. But there was a couple other things in the measurements that I thought, well, okay, those are problems, technically speaking but I didn't really notice them in my listening. So I'm actually gonna do a little bit more of a deep dive on this speaker than I've ever done before. We're gonna talk about some of the problems that I've noticed in the measurements, some of them that I heard, some of them that I didn't hear, and then I'll kind of give you my overall viewpoint of things after this is all said and done. Before I go any further, however, I want to give it a shout to a friend of mine, Scott Welch, he's out in Vacaville, California. Is it Vacaville? Pretty sure it's Vacaville. He owns a distribution company called Aegis Distribution, and they distribute all sorts of different products from different manufacturers, Don Audio being one. And what's really cool is I've known Scott for a long time from the car audio world. I made a post on my Facebook page saying, hey, I'm looking to test some Don Audio speakers. If anybody can help me out, please let me know. Scott was one of the first people to reach out. So if you're out in that general area, please give shot shot Scott a shout. I'm sure he'll appreciate that. I'll put a link to his distribution page in the comments below. I was not paid for this review and I think I'm going to pay for the return shipping, but I haven't asked Scott yet if he, if he can cover that or not. So yeah, I wasn't paid for this review. You're going to see the data. You're going to hear my honest assessment and then it's going to be right on to the next thing. Sometimes I like to talk about what I heard up front. Sometimes I don't. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. What I heard, a mostly neutral speaker. Now, as I was listening, there were two things that I noted in my notes pretty obviously stood out. One was there was a glare, and I put in my notes three to four kilohertz with a question mark because I thought it's somewhere in there. Sometimes it was sibilant, but most of the time what I heard was just a glaring sound that kind of stood out and jarred me. And I was like, I don't like that. I don't know what that is, but I don't like that. And another thing that I noticed was that there was more impact of, of snares, like harmonics and stuff like that seemed to stand out more with these speakers, which, hey man, I can't lie, I kind of dug it, I kind of dug it. The bass is really good. The speakers can get really loud, a hundred and something decibels at three and a half meters away loud. Not saying they don't distort, but any sort of audible distortion wasn't a factor. And the main thing that I'm listening for when I really stress test speakers like that, it's not so much like, you know, can they get loud and sound great? At that point, your hearing is going to be shot. I'm just saying, how loud can I get the speaker before it starts falling apart, before woofers start popping around and maybe I even blow something up? I didn't really have that problem with this speaker. I took it to about 100, 101 decibels at three and a half meters on average for music. And I was like, good Lord, that's enough. And I turned it back down and I just moved on to the next portion of my testing. Another feature about this speaker that I like is the wide radiation. Most of you know by now that I like a speaker that has about plus or minus 60 to 70 degrees radiation, give or take somewhere in there. This speaker fits that bill. But the one thing that really stood out to me about this particular speaker, and it's caused me to 
reconsider some of what I used to do and then quit doing is the imaging is super, super, super focused. I thought, all right, I didn't expect that from a wide radiating speaker. Now, when I review speakers, I usually talk in general terms and I look at the data to get more specific. And generally what I find is that wider radiating speakers have more room interaction. And if you have a livelier room, that means that you're gonna have a little bit of suffering in the image precision. So if there's an instrument over here in the soundstage and there's one over here in the soundstage, if there's a lot of precision, you're gonna hear them very distinctly. But if there's not quite a lot of precision, they may be a little bit blurred. They, you may not be able to exactly say, all right, to the millimeter, this is where that image is. And usually I find that's the case with wider radiating speakers, especially in a lively room. And with more narrow radiating speakers, there's less room interaction. And so the imaging is less befuddled, confused, obtuse. And those are kind of general things that I hear. So mentally biased, recognizing that when I see a dome tweeter on a flat baffle, I expect it's going to sound pretty wide. Most of the time it does. Sometimes it doesn't. There are other things going on. And it, I'm not really even thinking about imaging so much. So in this particular case, when I noticed that the images were like super sharp and well-defined, I thought, well, hold up. Now let's talk about some of the cons. That three kilohertz, four kilohertz area that I noticed, I didn't like that. It's too stingy, too aggressive, um, just a glaring sound that I just did not care for. The seven to 800 hertz region is where I noticed that it seemed to be like a little bit of extra weight maybe to snares and other percussion type instruments. And, you know, I kind of like that, but it's some, sometimes it maybe was a little bit too much for me. So that's, that's a draw for me. One thing I forgot to mention was that these speakers kind of had a laid back sound to them. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to see that in the data. And it's not something that stood out to me in my listening because when I listen critically, I'm listening for problems. And if a speaker doesn't present itself as problematic, then usually my review is pretty simple. It's just like, all right, this is a good speaker and I'm done. When there's a lot of problems, it's much easier to define them. Resonance is bright treble, treble, treble. Things of that nature that bother me are easier to notice. And, and maybe you're the same way. I'd be curious. Let me know in the comments how you review speakers on your own. But the laid back sound is something that is just there. And I don't notice it unless you say, hey, does it sound laid back or does it sound neutral? Because they're two different things. Laid back usually is where there's a BBC type dip in that one to three kilohertz region. Or it could also mean that there's a drop in the treble. And it just depends on who you're talking to and, and what their own definition of that is. So for me, it could go either way. With me having said that, let's go ahead and start looking at the data because this is a really interesting speaker and this is fun for me. Let's dive into this and see what we can find. All of my measurements are done using the Klippel near field scanner. This allows me to get anechoic measurements in a non-anechoic environment. And this is important to have because you're able to remove the speaker from the room and understand what is going on with just the speaker, as opposed to you plopping a speaker in your room and hearing some issues, thinking it's a speaker, and then two years later, when you got a little bit smarter in this, you realize, oh, it wasn't the speaker, it was my room, or it was where I had it located in the room. You just waste a lot of money. That's why I really like measurements, and also it allows us to go into deep dives and understand things about speakers that we may or may not like, and it makes our purchase decisions easier. This is the impedance, and I wanted to note this particular area where the impedance and the phase combine and basically drop down to below about three ohm. That's gonna pull a lot of current in this particular area, in this 100 to 200 hertz region. Therefore, you'll need to make sure that you're using a amplifier that can give you good current draw, at least four ohm stable amplifier for sure, and not power these with an integrated amp or an AVR that is not four ohm capable. Resonance and impedance measurements are usually a lot easier to identify and help you hone in on particular areas of problems. So if there's a resonance blip in the impedance, usually it comes down to a driver issue. Maybe the enclosure is just not quite built right. Maybe you've got some kind of port resonances. 
things of that nature. And in this particular case, I'm pointing out there's a blip around 500 hertz of the phase and the magnitude. And it's harder to tell because these lines are thick, but there's also another blip around 1.2 kilohertz right here. And I'm gonna zoom into this in a little bit. You'll see that a little bit more closely. This is the frequency response linearity and the listening window. And I've highlighted up here that the response linearity is about plus or minus 3 dB. It's within that window. You can see it's minus three to plus 2.3 decibels. Average sensitivity is 83.5. The F3 is 54 hertz and the F10 is 39 hertz. So getting down to 50 hertz, maybe even 40 hertz in most rooms shouldn't be a problem. And that will allow you to get good kick drum bass, but you're gonna to need to subwoofer. You wanna get really, really, really low. And you can't really put these speakers right next to a wall because there's a rear port and you don't really wanna chug that up. This is a Spinorama data and this is where we're gonna focus more of our efforts on. I pointed out a few areas. First of all, there's an enclosure resonance or resonances, a series of them from 500 hertz to one kilohertz. And that's all in this area. And we know that their resonance is because they occur in the on-axis response, the listening window, the early reflections, and the sound power. Now, this one right here is interesting. There's a dip in the frontal hemisphere of the response, and it's not there in the back. Now, I'm not really sure what causes that, but it's very interesting, and I wanted to point that out. But yes, we can see further resonances going further up the chain. There's one and around, what is that, about 700 and something hertz or 800 and something hertz or 700. There's one around one kilohertz. We see these consistent resonances. There's a series of them. Then there's this dip in the response. And this dip was the thing that made me pause and go, oh, this data does not look good. Now, if this dip had not been there and it had been more smooth, you know, some of these resonances, I might've just been like, eh, okay, you know, I've seen worse. It's not great, but I've seen worse. But the dip called itself immediately to my attention. And then I remember from all of my driver testing back in the day, I used to commonly see a dip in the response, which also matched up with the blip in the impedance, so a resonance in the impedance graph of a drive unit. I used to test drivers all the time, and it was very common that I'd see it from Don Audio, ScanSpeak, Audio Technology, uh, SB Acoustics, I think. Maybe it's just Tori had them but there's a lot of different companies who create drivers in this size range that have this kind of issue. Now, what this issue is, is a cone edge to surround termination issue. So what I've got is a little three and a half inch driver here, it's from ScanSpeak, and the cone edge would be this right here where it connects to the surround, and this is the surround. Now, what you want with an ideal speaker, or at least in theory is, you want that cone and that surround to move together as one. The surround is there basically just to hold the cone in place. If the cone and the surround are, maybe it's all one piece, then they should move together the same way. The thing is, they, they aren't. And in this particular case, you can actually see where the surround is attached to the cone. There's just a separate layer there. And what happens is there's a compliance issue where those two materials are moving almost out of phase with each other at a certain frequency. In this particular case, it's around 1.2 kilohertz. So when they do that, they create a little bit of a resonance blip there, and we see a dip in the response. Now, this also manifests in other ways in distortion data, and I'll show you that in a minute, but it's very clear to me what's going on there. Is it an issue? Well, it's a dip in the response. Is it ideal? No. Is it audibly annoying? No, not at all. Is it audible? Well, if you A-B'd it, you would notice, right? If you A-B'd having that sound versus not having that sound, you would notice it. But because it's not annoying, because it's not a peak in the response and a true resonance in the sense of it's illuminating things that shouldn't be illuminated, then it's not annoying and you just don't hear it. And what it results in is more of a, I would consider that maybe a laid back sound. And that's what I was getting at earlier. Now you'll note that I labeled these one and two. That's for a reason. I took the data, I grabbed the impulse response from the Clipple software, I ran it through Room EQ Wizard, and then I provided some information in a CSD. And what this is, is basically just a waterfall, and it shows over time what the signal is doing. And at low frequencies, we expect that the signal is going to decay a little bit longer, but at the higher frequencies, this really should just be one bar or one line representing the frequency response. And anything that comes after milliseconds later is stored energy of some sort. Now it can be stored energy in the cone of the speaker, usually higher frequency, or it can be stored energy in the enclosure. 
And that's what I'm seeing here in this particular data is stored energy in the enclosure anywhere from about 400 hertz to about one kilohertz. And in particular, there's this one around here, and I think it's about 575 hertz. These also show up in other areas. So they show up in the frequency response all in here, and they show up in here. I didn't hear those resonances and think that's a resonance. It just kind of stood out a little bit. So even though it wasn't terrible, at $3,000, this enclosure shouldn't be, shouldn't be illuminated like it is. And for what it's worth, after I wrapped up all of my own analysis, I went to Google to see if anybody has reviewed this. Stereophile has, and they have some CSD data as well. And theirs lines up very well with what I got. They show resonances in the enclosure, from the enclosure at least, from about 500 to 800 hertz, give or take. The second thing that I talked about was the cone edge surround resonance. So what I did was I actually removed the drive unit from the enclosure just to test this to make sure I was right. I swept the impedance on the drive unit itself, and then I saw, sure enough, here's a blip in the impedance response. So showing a resonance of some sort. Basically, I just verified it's not the enclosure, it's the driver. Moving on, we're going to talk about the estimated interim response. So I'm showing you zero degrees and 30 degrees. Zero degrees is on axis, speaker aimed directly at your face and 30 degrees is off axis with the speaker back parallel to the wall behind the speaker. That's usually how people who don't know how to set up a speaker will aim it. Most speakers, however, are designed to be aimed on axis. So that's why I test both zero and 30 to give you an idea of, hey, where should I aim the speaker? What was the design axis most likely intended to be? Then if I draw a trend line through here, we can kind of get an idea of what the speaker may present itself as. Now, remember this is all relative. And what I'm showing you is really how I heard this particular speaker. I heard this particular speaker as having a little bit of a recess sound in the one to two kilohertz region, but this three kilohertz area was the most glaring issue for me. These resonances are kind of subdued in the overall response. I mean, they do stick out above the mid range a little bit, but to me, it was nowhere near as annoying as this three kilohertz area. This is the horizontal radiation, and we can see it's about plus or minus 70 degrees or so. What I wanna call it specifically though is the enclosure resonances. And we can see that showing up in the off axis data. So we see some resonance around, what is this, 500? So let's say it's about six, 700 Hertz at the back of the speaker. And then closer to around 500 to 800 Hertz, as you go to the sides of the speaker, there's sidewall resonances. So this speaker's enclosure is making its own sound. This is the vertical response. And I'm just gonna say plus or minus 10 degrees, you're safe. You can maybe go plus or minus 20 degrees, but plus or minus 10 degrees above the tweeter line, below the tweeter line, you're okay. But again, more importantly to me is the enclosure resonances that show up. All of this red is extra energy. Now, for a standard speaker like this, the red should be at the front of the speaker. You really shouldn't have any red behind the speaker. So what this means is there's stored energy being released at the top of the enclosure, energy at the bottom of the enclosure toward the back and energy at the back of the enclosure. And it's not one resonance at the same frequency. You'll notice this frequency range is different than this frequency range. So it's multiple frequencies that this enclosure is resonating with. Moving on to the distortion, this is 86 decibels at one meter. And what I wanted to do here is call out another telltale sign of the standard cone edge surround compliance issue. Always manifests as high second order distortion, always. So I see that here, no different. That's exactly what I would expect. So it's a sanity check. Now we're moving on to the 96 decibels at one meter. Distortion still is pretty good. I mean, I pointed this out a minute ago. Let me go back to the 86 decibels. It's not bad. I mean, we see spikes going on here, but in overall level, it's actually still pretty low. It's below 1%, below negative 40 decibels. And if I go back to the 90 decibels or 96 decibels at one meter, it's still pretty low, even into the lower frequency area. And you don't hit 3% uh, 3, 3 THD until about 50 hertz. So that's, that's pretty good. It's not the greatest I've seen, but it's pretty good. Now we're gonna look at multi-tone distortion. Multi-tone distortion looks pretty good, but again, see this one kilohertz area? That's kind of funky, isn't it? But remember there's that surround edge resonance and I'm willing to bet that's what that is. Now, if I band pass the signal from 80 Hertz and above and drop the base portion of the multi-tone test, we can see the distortion does decrease a little bit, but you've still got that 
the 1.5 kilohertz area kind of standing out. Now we're gonna look at the compression data and at 102 decibels, there's some dips going on or some different kind of compression going on around 125, 150 hertz or so. But the interesting thing to me is that it actually kind of seems reasonably well maintained. I'm not seeing huge drop-offs at this highest output level. And that goes to what I heard when I was listening. I was really cranking on these speakers and the woofer wasn't really giving up. I was surprised. I mean, there was no plop, plop or like from the woofer. So that was a good thing for me. It means that there's at least mechanically good dynamic range. Now, in terms of distortion and things like that, yeah, you might run into some other issues, but mechanically, the speaker can take higher output level. Interesting again, 500 Hertz, some sort of compression distortion and then compression distortion. I mean, these to me are resonance issues. Now the question is, Aaron, would you buy these speakers? I mean, you've, you presented data, you've, you've talked about what you thought it sounded like, and I gotta be honest with you, I would probably still consider buying them if I could notch out that three kilohertz area. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Remember that one of my favorite speakers is the Wharfdale Linton, the 85, and it also has a little bit of a dip between one to three kilohertz. I can't remember exactly where it is. So me personally, I'm not gonna have an issue with that dip. Now, would I prefer it not be there? Yeah, sure. But I'm okay with that, especially when you're talking about this speaker, considering all the other good things it does, the imaging tightness, the radiation, the, the base output, and the, well, the capability of SPL output. So there's a lot of good things going for, but that three kilohertz, that's the one that I'm like, mother. That's it for this review. So I hope you learned something. I hope you appreciated the time that I spent, you know, breaking things down a little bit more than I normally do. I know I certainly enjoyed it and I hope that it shows through in my passion. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.